Something which has been really concerning me, an increasing trend as more of us find ourselves separated from our elders, our parents especially, those who are in old age and of course anything could happen and they're living far away. I think many of us have some kind of family structure like that. Many of us have ethnic origins that mean that the family is spread out over a wide uh, part of the world. And often what happens is that a person might pass and a particular, I want to say a dominant figure, the patriarch maybe of the home, the eldest son, for example, or an uncle or whatever it is, wants the janaza, wants the ghusl, wants the key burial aspects delayed for them to get there. You might be in America and you will try to get back to Pakistan. You might be in the UK, need to get back to Malaysia might be in Canada wanting to get back to Morocco. The idea that the whole process should be delayed just so that you can attend because of your emotional need. And I know that we need to be sensitive. And of course, we've seen in the fiqh of death how much we've been speaking about being very cognizant about the emotional needs of those that are grieving. And we do need to be sensitive, but we also need to be, I don't know, honest enough with ourselves to hold ourselves accountable and let's talk about rights. Let's talk about whose right should be protected first. Who is the most important person to actually protect in all of this, this, this situation? And it's the right of the deceased. The right of the deceased comes before anybody else. And the Prophet Sallallahu said when it comes to the deceased that if they were, hurry up with the process of the burial, hurry up with the deceased. Because if they were a righteous person, then you're putting them forward to good. But if they were not that, then you are removing an evil off your own necks. The Prophet ﷺ said that as narrated in Bukhari. This hadith is not just super authentic, super important, but also, I believe, acts as a reminder of how little we are in touch with the metaphysical side of life, the spiritual side of life, that we don't believe that there are causes and effects in the things that happen to us. We are so confident in everything that we see and do and we always believe that it's our fault or their fault and we don't think outside the box that maybe it's because of certain aspects of life that are we weren't considering as important previously but now are having an impact an evil that's taken off your necks think about this part of the hadith that means that we are affected by our surroundings we are affected by people's almost energy you heard obviously you know Habib made that very very popular right? positive energy I feel good energy right this is a, a, a phrase which is now very common a lot of people kind of Real, but it's real, it's true. There is such a thing as positive energy. There is such a thing as good vibes. There is such a thing as negative energy. And so it's not just your right that you need to be there at the Janazah prayer and pray over this person. There's the rights of the deceased, the rights of the people who are in that locality as well. And so this selfishness that we find is unacceptable. It's not permissible to delay the burial. And you will find so many ahadith on this, on this matter, so many issues. And people will turn around and say, well, what about the janazah prayer? I'll miss it. My brother and sister, if you are listening to this, of course, that's what the reason why the class is there for you to really educate yourself on this chapter. But maybe send them this video so that they realize that this is not about you. Yes, we want you to pray over your deceased and make dua for them. But your primary focus is dua for them. And then when you are able to get there, if it's late, don't delay the whole process, but then you will do what the Prophet ﷺ did, which is to then go and pray after the person has been buried. We know that this happened a number of times for, for the Prophet ﷺ. For example, there was a, a lady who used to clean the masjid. And, you know, subhanAllah, the Sahaba, when they narrated this incident, they were not even sure whether she was a lady or a man. Even in some narrations where they, it was a boy, it's like happening in the background. But the Prophet Sallallahu knew very well who she was because she'd been gone for a while and it was, a, you know, uh, she, he didn't see her and he was like, what happened to the lady? Where's she gone? And they said, oh yeah, she passed away. We, uh, 
we, uh, we, uh, we, you know, we dealt with her burial and uh, we dealt with her janazah, we buried her. Uh, why did you not tell me? Why did you not tell me? And they, and the, the narrator, Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, he said that they tried to kind of make it out like that she was, yani they tried to make it out to be a minor. Ya Rasulullah, you know, it's not that important. She's not all that. And, and you know, it's not. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then said something very, very uh, important. He says, in the Hadi al Qubur, these graves, Mamlu'atun Dhulmatan ala ahliha. They are full of darkness for its inhabitants. Wa inna Allah Azza wa Jal yunawwiruha lahum li salati alayhim. And Allah will illuminate these gra graves through my prayer for them. Dulluni ala qabriha. Show me her, where her grave is. And so he then was led to her grave and he prayed over her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not only did he pray over her, but those sahaba that had already prayed over her, prayed over, the, over her as well. Second time with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This also happened with another lady that's narrated by Imam Nasai, who was very ill and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam feared that there was going to be you know, an imminent death. And so he said, let me make sure you tell me uh, if that happens. And what happened is that she was from Al-Awali. Those who are with me in my programs, the Tarbiyah programs will know that, how, that we get our dates from Al-Awali and we go and visit that area on the way to Masjid Al-Quba, which is about five odd miles from the, um, about five miles from Masjid Nabawi. And you will see that, that it takes time. You know, obviously she passed away around the Dhuhr time. She was then prepared and washed and then uh, uh, carried to uh, Al-Baqiyah, al Al-Gharqad, which is the graveyard of what we call Baqiyah, next to the Masjid of Al-Nabawi, next to the Prophet's house. By the time that they got there, it was night time and the Prophet was sleeping. So they knew that he had told them that, make sure you tell me if she passes away. But they were like, oh, we can't wake him up for this now. She's only some miskina. And actually, they even called her the miskina, right? Like some poor, nondescript person, whatever, right? And so they buried her at night. And when the Prophet ﷺ woke up in the morning and he found out, he goes, why didn't you tell me? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, you were sleeping. It was, it, was, it was late. Now what's fascinating for me in this hadith, and so many things to take from this, is that he was upset and he criticized them, but not for the fact that they did not delay for one second, that they rushed in and made sure that she was buried at night time. Look at the, the haste, okay? Burying at night time, they don't have floodlights, electricity, machinery. It's kind of chaos, yeah, and it's so difficult to do, you know, in an area. If you've ever lived in the villages without electricity, to do all of this kind of thing and to make sure you get everything right. But so you'd say to yourself, just delay 12 hours, man. Wait till, wait, wait till, the, wait till the daytime, right? And that makes more sense. But no, they knew that the, uh, the, the most important thing was to make sure that she is buried as soon as possible and so they did that and he didn't criticize them for that what he criticized them for was why didn't you wake me up because in that narration he said because my salah is a rahma for them it's a mercy for them and then the prophet sallallahu then went and he lined up the companions behind him and they prayed uh, over her and the prophet sallallahu did this again for another one that was known as al-manbuz which is like it's another poor person we also know, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu when he was out of town, narrated by Imam Al-Tirmidhi, uh, 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 Sa'id ibn Musayyib narrates that uh, Um Sa'ad, one of the uh, Sahabiyat, she had passed away and the Prophet Sallallahu was away for a month. And the Prophet Sallallahu when he came back and found out, then he prayed uh, over her, over her grave, at the grave. And so we know that this is something which is a, an act of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and here's the, here's the thing there are some scholars yes it's true that the Hanafi school considers this to be not permissible that once a person has passed away then that's the end of it and even one narration from Imam Malik as well um, that once, the, prayer, once the, the, the person is buried then you can't pray the janazah and they explained all of these hadith right because the person might say well what about all these narrations well they said well no, all these narrations what they indicate is that the Prophet Sallallahu prayed for, for these and this is specific to the Prophet Sallallahu because only he has that special characteristic and we spoke about this characteristic of course 
in the hadith of in various other parts of the class um, which obviously you can check out in terms of specifically putting in the two twigs in order to protect the inhabitants of the grave and so on and so forth this discussion is actually very interesting how do you tell whether something is specific to the Prophet Sallallahu or whether it can be uh, uh, continued by others actually the majority of the, uh, major the majority of the scholars Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, other narration from Imam Malik the majority of scholars said no it is uh, permissible to pray over the uh, deceased especially if they've not had a prayer offered for them and they were buried without one or there's someone who has a vested interest a family member and the like then of course they can pray for that person too and that this is not specific to the Prophet Sallallahu because the Prophet Sallallahu didn't prohibit any of the Sahaba from doing it in fact they had already prayed and he asked them to join him in the prayer so they prayed over those people with the Prophet Sallallahu which clearly proves that it's not something specific and also you know for example when we want to try and identify whether something is specific you look at another test like the Hadith of Al-Wisal which is continuous fasting the Prophet Sallallahu said that you're not allowed to do that and yet he continued to do that when they asked him well, what about you Ya Rasulullah he said I'm not the same as you guys Allah is the one who feeds me right meaning that I don't I, I don't need the food and drink as much as you guys do and so we know that so when, 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 when the companions try to do something and they're not meant to he'll make it clear but he didn't say that for them in this case that shows to us that it is something which is uh, 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 right and allowed for us to do that's the position of the majority of scholars and this idea by the way that uh, that, uh, that there has there's a time limit there's no evidence for that either if a person is delayed in getting to the janazah then so be it i want you to know that if you want to summarize this situation we know that you should be super quick look at aisha radiallahu anha what she said about abu bakr as-siddiq she said that he passed away on tuesday night he was buried on tuesday night imagine that passed away on tuesday night buried on tuesday night and Aisha again when it came to her brother Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr radiallahu an so he was on a journey and he was trying to get to Mecca and he passes away like about 20 odd miles or whatever from uh, Mecca and what they did is that they they took his body whilst he had passed away and they didn't deal with it for like a day or two or whatever it was until they got to Mecca and then buried him and subhanAllah is so instructional that when Aisha went to visit him she said to him uh, like uh, uh, went to visit the grave firstly she prayed her Salatul Janazah over the grave by herself proof not only of praying but this is the same for a woman same for a male you know from the class my opinion on women in the graveyard etc etc and also what she said to Abdurrahman who's passed away that rhetorical kind of statement she says man if I was here I would have buried you right here I would have buried you right where you had passed away meaning there shouldn't be no delay she's seen how her father passed okay how it's done there and then and immediately no delay for anybody imagine yani, the Abu Bakr passing away on Tuesday night and being buried Tuesday night not waiting to gather all the people because the haq of the deceased it's not your right I know that you're grieving but I know that people want to get in there I know that people want to come up I know that people are working but you've got to try to protect the the right of the deceased they are first and foremost each and every single time and I want to say this that of course if there's some legal impediment there's something which you know there has to be an obligatory post-mortem a lot of time when hospitals claim this in the West it's not absolutely necessary and there are ways around it you can get it expedited but obviously if there are legal impediments or obviously the the graveyards are not available and the staff are not available then you need to then delay until the next day then that little bit of delay which is necessary is okay but to delay by two days three days for people to fly in this is not right let it happen just like we see we see the companions always rushing Abdullah bin Mas'ud Abdullah bin Zubair uh, 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 when he when any member of his family would 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 pass he would be saying quickly quickly let's get out of the body let's get out of the body that should be our attitude and then we, we, if we are late then we are late we missed it but we didn't miss out we missed it meaning the congregational janazah prayer that was pr prayed fundamentally but we didn't miss out because we then come to the grave and then we pray and how would you do that so this is the Muslim section of our local uh, graveyard and I'll show you how uh, the, 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 the prayer is offered of course that we say when we arrive to the Muslim graveyard or the Muslim section of a graveyard is Assalamu alaikum ahlal diyar min al-mu'mineen wa al-muslimin wa inna insha'Allah bikum lalahikun na sallallahu alayhi wa lakum al-afiyah as you have obviously learned in the class already and I specifically want to use 
the grave of one of our most beloved uncles, alayhi rahmatullah, Uncle Muhammad Anwar, as an example who we buried not long ago. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him. And you will come to the grave of your, of your uh, beloved, of your deceased. And as a male, this is the way that they are facing. This is the direction of the, the Qibla. And so all of the deceased that you can see in a Muslim graveyard, in, in, in a, a Muslim section or Muslim graveyard, as per the rules of fiqh, as, as per obviously the details in the class, will be lying on their side or the whole body to face towards the Qibla or at least their head. And because for the men will stand here, if it was a female, you'd stand in the middle of the grave. But because it's a male, then we'll stand with the grave in front of you towards the Qibla. So you face towards the Qibla and you'll have the grave in, in front of you, just like you would if the person was out in with their, with their coffin. And then you will then do the, the janazah prayer as per the class. The first takbir, Allahu Akbar. You will recite Surah Billahi Minash Tarajim Bismillahir Rahim and recite Surah Al Fatiha and then Allahu Akbar and then you will recite the Durood Sharif Allah Musal Allah Muhammad Wa Al Muhammad then Allahu Akbar and then you will recite the Dua Allah Maghfir Lahiyina Wa Mayyitina and uh, uh, or other versions which have been authentically narrated as from the class Allahu Akbar and then Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah and the variations that we covered in the uh, uh, as per the opinions of Fiqh which of course are in detail in the class. The key that I want to bring to your attention is the importance of, of protecting the right of the deceased. It's their right that they are buried as soon as possible, that they go to that delight that Allah has promised them, and not that you are here uh, to make that, that, that congregational uh, prayer. This janazah prayer for you by, the, by yourself might be even more purer, might be even more better, might be even more sincere. And that's something good for you, and it's also something which is good for the deceased. So I hope that this reminder is taken in the best of uh, best of spirit and best of light. This is something that we all need educating on, and I pray that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala allows us to benefit from this and to implement it to preserve the right um, of the family that are grieving, but most importantly to preserve the rights of our deceased who deserve better. Wallahu Taala Alam.